Hi, guys, and welcome to the Lifetime Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, John Zombro, and today is episode number 112. The title is Let's Talk About Surgery. And so I have the great opportunity to talk about surgery as well as other health, fitness, and peak performance items with my amazing and fabulous co host, PK. Good morning, PK. How are you doing? Good morning, John. I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, I am. I'm on fire. Uh, shout out to Galen Rupp. You know, just won the uh, uh, Men's Olympic Trials Marathon down in Atlanta on Saturday. Yeah, shout out. I was not glued to the uh, the coverage, but I'm sure that you were. Well, I, I actually, I wasn't because uh, I was in the middle of the hard to kill mm. workshop m myself, right. but, uh, I, and I should have put money on it, uh, honestly, because, uh, uh, I never doubted the mighty Rupster. Uh, he was my pick, uh, first pick overall, uh, uh, to win. And there were a lot of people, not that I'm always the best prognosticator, but there were a lot of people, some of my, my peers included that were all, you know, we've got some of these, uh, these up and comers or these athletes that are coming from, uh, you know, trail racing or different kinds of things. And I'm like, well, no chance. And, and that's really uh, Rupp decimated the field and, you know, his, his track cred and his leg speed. Um, it was just no, no one had a match for that. No, really? Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So uh, many of the things that we're talking about here on the show are, um, you know, epitomized by that. But but moving on, you know, here there I was, you know, uh, just uh, I'm still buzzing, man. I was just steeped in the richness that is or that was the hard to kill workshop. And uh, um, it was just so fun to engage with folks on a number of topics. And of course, that workshop was our, uh, our local version here in, uh, in Bozeman, but I do have that available for, uh, you know, for groups that want to just take things to the next level in terms of how do you combine lifelong health with peak performance and really crush it. So if you're a gym or uh, an organization, a group of coaches, healthcare a provider group, that's really uh, uh, who will get the most out of this uh, hard to kill experience. And I'd be happy to bring it to you. So if, if you have an interest, reach out to me. But in terms of, or speaking of reaching out, as many of the listeners will know, last week we had a couple of pod, or we had one podcast and we had a couple of uh, two part uh, blog uh, post series, two articles that I came up with the idea, hey, let's make March Metabolic Flexibility Month. Yes. And what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, so, you know, we talked about, I won't uh, beat that point down, but this whole idea of, of really looking at athletic nutrition and trying to, you know, go beyond what we do nutritionally for health and health preservation, which is always the platform or the, the foundation that we use, but then moving into how do you uh, tweak the levers and dials with your protein, with your carbohydrate intake, uh, with your fats, uh, you know, what's the literature say? And also how can we, we do that to, to just get more results, kick more ass. Absolutely. So what if someone wants to get involved with your, uh, with your metabolic flexibility month? So I just, I've decided that since this month, we're going to focus on, on improving this metabolic flexibility in all of you lifetime athletes, uh, lifetime athletes out there. Hey, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Um, and, and we're using, you know, a very loose framework that I'm now calling the metabolic flexibility for athletes diet, <laughs> which was featured in <laughs> the, the media that we had last week. So if you'd like to look that up, it's easily accessible through the website. Um, and, and we're, we're going to have a group meeting. I'm going to put together a group meeting on zoom, uh, this Friday, this coming Friday, I believe that is March 6, uh, to discuss all things, athletic nutrition, again, a little bit different athletic nutrition and metabolic flexibility. Awesome. Well, I'm excited yeah. to hear about how, how that goes. If you're interested at all, if you caught us last week, if you didn't catch us last week, it's just, uh, you know, go down one in your queue and tap into that podcast or, uh, or, or find those uh, blog posts or newsletters if you haven't got to them yet. But uh, John, let's get into what we're talking about today. The title of the episode, of course, is let's talk about surgery. Why are we talking about surgery today? Ah, for lifetime athletes. Like all, yes. hu like all humans, <laughs> you know, whether, whether we like it or not, and I don't know why we would like it. Um, injuries do happen, doggone it. Mm. You know, life happens, beep happens. It, it does. And, and sometimes surgeries happen. Yeah, they, I mean, they, they do. It is a, it's uh, I, I could say that uh, e even though the surgery itself is um, you know, surgeries are, are 
difficult. It's one of the major benefits of the modern advanced medicine that we have is that we can repair stuff. Oh, it, it truly is. And so I think that's how we'll dive into today. Just looking at some, uh, you know, different angles, different sides of the uh, surgical experience, shall we say, and also some tips for folks to uh, negotiate that or navigate it most successfully. So first off, I would say, you know, we can have these acute injuries, you know, these sudden things, which are usually accidental, um, that, that basically result in some part of the body being broken or torn in half or otherwise. Uh, and, and really, that's one of the great strengths of, of orthopedic surgery, speaking uh, specifically to that today for athletes, uh, because we can surgically repair, stitch, screw, bolt, plate, put back together the broken stuff. Absolutely. I mean, it is, it is amazing when you look at it from that perspective. Yeah, and, and just the, the advancement of technology, so wonderful. But you know what? We can also have cumulative injuries, you know, whether they're traumatic um, or, or what sometimes are called chronic or overuse problems. Ultimately, we can get enough wear and tear, which result in the need for, you know, another form of orthopedic surgery, which is joint replacements. And, and we have that available also as a wonderful tool uh, to extend function in the human beast when things, um, you know, uh, didn't go so well. No question. Absolutely no question. So I guess my point would be orthopedic surgery can be necessary and it, it's quite valuable, but we really have to, first of all, appreciate, the, and this is something I've seen a lot in folks that they, they didn't quite understand <clears throat> going into, is that surgery is an injury in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, it really is. And it is a traumatic experience for the body. Is that kind of what you mean by an injury in and of itself? Yeah, totally. So, you know, whether one is, you know, when, when you're fixing something, obviously, you're, you know, cutting, slicing, bolting, screwing, hammering, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, things that are happening that are just, you know, small, uh, well, actually, not even small, sometimes significant injuries to the body in getting the fixing done. And so uh, I just want to mention that so people don't overlook it. So, you know, if you have to have a surgery, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the first day after, uh, you may feel as though you've been run over by a bus, um, which is almost normal, and, and, and don't expect to feel that everything's perfect. And now I can be at 100 or 105 uh, percent right away. That's really not uh, realistic. Yeah, and I think that you have some great stuff that we're going to get into a little later about about kind of adopting that mentality. But you're exactly right, and I do I do think I you know I think uh, I've had a couple in my in my life, and 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 we kind of we we think that we're going to feel better than we do, even if it's a major one. So I think that that's a uh, that's a good mentality to adopt. You know, one thing that I'm thinking of when we're just kind of looking at surgeries from super high level, and again. I am just a man on the street here, but I've witnessed, um, I've witnessed some surgeries. I've had some myself, and this is a thought that I had, and I'd like to get your feedback on this, but uh, this really does come from the man on the street perspective is that if you're faced with having a surgery and choosing to have one or not to have one, it's my, it's my thought that you're the one who's in charge and you need to look out for your own best interests. So when you're thinking about it, you're the boss and the surgeon or, or any doctor really, I guess, like that is a subcontractor, it's a specialist. And so um, what I mean is that I, I think that we assume that they see the big picture and have our best, best interest in mind, but often, and again, John, I love your thoughts on this, they're kind of narrow or myopic in their view, and they bring stuff, their experiences, their ego, money, prestige in, into the mix that can affect how they see you. And so one of the old adages that I always think about is a hammer sees a nail. And so you need to kind of see the holistic big picture and decide whether you need a hammer or not. So I understand that this might sound jaded, that might be judgmental, but um, I've had a handful of bad experiences in a quality of surgery, but also in the sort of interpersonal relationship. So I can admit this bias, but... <clears throat> I think that kind of adopting that mentality of taking ownership when you're thinking about surgery and specifically is a smart call. Again, that's man on the street perspective. John, I'd like your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. I think it's potentially uh, complex and varied, uh, you know, with each, with each person. <laughs> you have, you, you have worked intimately, of course, all of that. I'm just saying, 
you know, you got to be in control and uh, you got to be in charge. You got to have adopt that. Yeah, I think the very first thing that comes out when you're saying that is, you know, that's one of our basic principles here at the Lifetime Athlete is ownership, you know, and, sure. you know, owning yourself, taking responsibility for, you know, your health, performance, longevity, that kind of thing. And, and yeah, that's very true where, you know, we, we you know, in past generations, I think we've, we've had a, a stronger mindset, which was, well, you know, the, the physician knows all and mm -hmm. is all, all seeing and all caring. And, and therefore, you know, I'm just going to just sort of disinvest myself and just turn myself over and they're going to make everything good. And, 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 and sometimes that's indeed true in the most you know, critical care situations. But the, the point that I would make is uh, we, I don't think we ever want to let anything related to health and well-being become overly passive you know it has mm. to be active mm -hmm. and self-driven and we have to engage so that gets to what you were saying it's about well you know you're you're basically hiring a surgeon in this case um to do some very skilled work and mm. and so uh, you know i i've had a lot of you know positive experiences in in that uh, arena you know from my career but also you know a few things where you know things were maybe not as high you know on on that and, and certainly that was there can be individuals in any field who might peg the ego meter a little high or, you know, or whatever. But one of the things I find is that we really have, it almost gets down to like psychology, which is one of my kind of side areas of study. Um, the personality characteristics that make a good surgeon, that make a person very attentive to detail and procedure, generally they, they don't come also with the same personality that is, you know, uh, the most kind, caring, attentive, uh, funny bedside manner, you know, that, that's actually, those are different things. And so, well, you know, I sometimes have to remind a person, you know, you're hiring the surgeon to do the surgery, not to be your best buddy. And, and I don't mean that, you know, in any way negatively towards you because without going too deep, I know you've had some experiences where, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, you, you did all those things and you were still met with, uh, uh, someone who had a hammer and saw you as a nail and also wasn't um, really interested in listening at all. And, and that's a problem. We need to, that, that needs to be addressed. But um, yeah, so talking about the personality difference. And so I, I think what I get from this is, first of all, anytime we have these types of interactions, especially if a person's in pain or we're, you know, contracting to do something that, you know, is very serious with respect to life and also, you know, money's involved, you know, large amounts mm. of, um, this is an opportunity for grace and, and humility, you know, and, and we all as humans need to really how I like to look at, at trying to be a good leader, trying to build teams, communicate with people, the preservation of dignity. There's a way to do it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, it should be automatic where we can preserve everyone's dignity in a situation. So that's, you know, I would say that's important. You know, I know I've went sure, down the sure. rabbit hole deeper than maybe you cared for me to do, but uh, final thing, I've got a funny story. I have one of my friends is a surgeon and um, he's a great guy. And uh, we were having a, a, a conversation actually at a, at a, at a barbecue uh, not too many years ago. And <laughs> he was, he was kind of saying, gosh, you know, I don't know how you can do this in, in the, you know, the, the physical therapy or clinical world, because you have to work with these people one-on-one -on -one, face to face through their, their problems and struggles and pain and communicate with them for like an hour. And I was like, yeah, you know, that's what we do. And, and I didn't think. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, you know, it's a coaching relationship. You know, you're coaching a person and, and there's a lot of good interpersonal dynamics. That's what's happening. He's like, I am so glad that whenever I have to do my serious work, people are under anesthesia. Really? That's hilarious. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, again, it's almost like saying, Hey, you know, we, I feel for you, bro, because, uh, it's like, yeah, you know, that, that type of interaction that, that like say I would do in these coaching and therapeutic relationships was a real stretch and a discomfort for him. And he really wanted to be able to concentrate on his very focused surgical work. And so if the person is knocked out and they can't interact, Hey, <laughs> that's actually a win. And so, you know, again, I think uh, we, we, we looked at some possibly serious things, but also looked at the light side of it too. Sure. But I mean, that's, I mean, and you're precisely right that you're, you know, these are the type of, you know, hard charger that actually gets to a point where they're capable and built a practice on being an excellent surgeon. Those are, you know, it doesn't surprise me that that's the type of 
you know, hey, let me just get to work on what I need to do. It's kind of like, a, it's, it might be a terrible metaphor, but like, you know, someone who's a, um, a woodworker, they're in the shop, they're, they're going to be good at their craft, not necessarily chatting with you. So I think that like, uh, that absolutely makes sense. Um, John, do you want to get down a little deeper? I think that uh, maybe we talk about some stories about, you know, surgeries. You want to get started there? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, we've just got a couple of these, but I think each one's a little bit unique and has some uh, perspectives. Um, my my son, uh, who is a 28 year old male, um, soon to be 29, uh, he was uh, he was in a ski related accident. Oh gosh, no, where, where are we at? Uh, I want to tell you, it's 10 or 11 days out now. Uh, so just an unfortunate, very, uh, very uh, unfortunate, just how, how things came together in the universe, one in a million chance in the bad way for him was he was uh, skiing at one of our local resorts and uh, was uh, essentially just uh, cruising down uh, a green run, you know, uh, just uh, warming up in the morning. And he was taken out blindsided steamrolled by um, an out of control runaway tourist skier who was straight lining down the mountain and flattened him. Mm, that is just, that's a nightmare. Yeah. So he never saw it coming. And, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't remember anything until he woke up and the ski patrol was there. So that's kind of uh, you know, the first thing, but he, he suffered quite a few injuries. You know, he, uh, he was wearing a helmet, but uh, he had a, a mild concussion he had a uh, very a fairly serious laceration of his ear. Um, you know, basically the 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 person just never said anything. You never heard him coming. But when he flattened him, he basically skied over him, and uh, mm. the uh, metal edge of the ski, it, you know, pushed the helmet up and sliced his ear in half. And um, mm. then uh, he uh, shattered his collarbone into, or that's a clavicle, into multiple pieces. Five broken ribs, punctured lung punctured lung and bruised kidneys so you know it's medical emergency uh, you know obviously and uh, we uh, uh, were very thankful that you know it wasn't worse and he's going to he's going to recover but you know eventually he wound up uh, at the local hospital and there was uh, a couple days where they had to just the focus was to get him medically stable and uh, you know that's that's always you know critical in the triage uh, component but uh, he, he needed to have a surgery. He just had to wait a, a few days until he was able to undergo that procedure. And so the surgery was to um, essentially take all the fragments of uh, the broken collarbone and, uh, and, and make him, uh, you know, make him a Terminator, a cyborg. Now he has a titanium. <laughs> That <laughs> one, and uh, and so that's kind of the story. He, and he's going to do well. He's going to have a good recovery. He's got a he's got a pretty good therapist to work with him. But um, nonetheless, uh, uh, you know, I think you know, there's some talking about some uh, stories there. Um, I had to uh, you know give him some counsel on. Well. Uh, there's a process here, you know, that yeah. when we have an injury or we wind up in the hospital, you have a surgery that we, we have to undergo recovery and healing first. And so I, I have a model, we've talked about it on the show before, but it's just really important to get, get into that kind of acceptance mode as opposed to, you know, anger bargaining denial, which can, you know, those things can happen. Uh, and so that, you know, he's, he's done a good job. He's worked, he's worked through that. And, um, I was just so impressed with the, uh, the, the efficiency and the quality of, uh, the surgeon and all the people involved, you know, they did a great job with them and, uh, uh it looks like it's going to be a really good repair. And so this is just a case where, gosh, there was some really, uh, nasty things happen and, uh, he's put back together and, uh, you know, starting now to feel better and, and get ready to start on his, his rehabilitation journey. So, um, really, uh, we're very thankful for, uh, you know, the, the skills of the, the, all the people involved, particularly the surgeon that he worked with. Yeah. Well, and in, in many ways, this, uh, today's episode is because this is a recent, very intense experience for you. And, uh, um, I think it's interesting there, you know, we, we had talked cause we talk often, you know, off the pod, but, um, what you just said about having a conversation and kind of a addressing the emotional 
side of the uh, of the surgery experience, in addition to the sort of tactical and you know physically physic physical and traumatic side, that uh, that's interesting. Um, how, I mean, how important do you think that uh, that is, or where does it fit in, or sort of I don't know. That's just interesting to me. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I think in just global terms, you know, no matter what happens to sure. any of us. Um, we need to f eventually find a way to make some form of peace with that. And mm. then the next thing is, you know, we've got to have that buy-in, you know, buy-in with ourselves, with the process, uh, you know, with, with whoever uh, we're entrusting to work with us in different capacities. You know, and so that's, uh, again, I think maybe that's not any less of an important side, but some people would say it's the softer side of uh, injuries and healing and surgeries and recovery. But yeah, you know, uh, uh, it's a process, and um, whenever you have, whenever you have trauma or you have secondary trauma, which is a surgery, we talked about that being an injury. Uh, man, the body gets stunned, and it's a bit of a shockwave. And you know, we need to uh, let understand that that's happening or going to happen, and then let it kind of fade and and let ourselves recover uh, before we, you know, again go to the next uh, level or assignment. Mm. Interesting. Such good stuff. Yeah, and I, I've got another story that's a personal story, but um, you know I'm hogging it up today, so I shouldn't. And maybe you would like to share uh, one of your um, observations about a family member. Sure, sure, I will. Yeah, this this is kind of interesting to me. Um, so a handful of years, my mom had a knee replacement, and uh, she is a at the time she was in her late sixties, and she had a very very successful knee replacement. And, uh, you know, she's um, certainly a lifetime athlete and, you know, kind of a recreational tennis slash pickleball player and sort of active um, in, in those types of leisure sports, you know, some, some hiking, et cetera, but, it, but an active sort of um, healthy person. And she had a super successful surgery. And uh, so what I thought was interesting, and this is just having listened to um, her story is that in the community and sort of the, the age that she's in, her peers asked her a lot, in particular men um, who were having uh, knee replacements since hers went so well. And, and hers went well, not, not only in her experience, but kind of empirically. And her surgeon said she was, uh, you know, it went like as well as he could remember. Very little mm -hmm. pain, inflammation very little downtime. And this is compared to her peers. And this is by the surgeon, the PT staff. So not only was it a good experience for her, but kind of getting feedback from the experts who do this on the day to day, they said, it went well for you. So she felt good. They said, you did a good job. And so many of her peers would ask her what her secret was. This is kind of like, Hey, mm -hmm. I got to have one of these. What's your secret? And, um, she said that she, uh, she would say two things and she would start here. She would say, well, you need to be at a good weight for your body. And she said that if someone was asking, she would just be super honest. And uh, she's certainly not sort of a, a gruff woman, but if, if someone you know, needed to lose some weight, she would say, yeah, you know, and hey, Jack, probably you need to lose 30 pounds for it to go well. And, uh, What's interesting, you you know my mom, John. She's she's mm -hmm. not cruel by she's any awesome. stretch. She was just saying, hey, this is this is what's real, and I think this is what I was at a really good lean weight for myself going into it. And um, she said that uh, most of the time when she said that, the eyes would glass over, <laughs> and like literally they didn't want to hear it. But the second one I think is the most is is equally interesting. She did a lot of acupuncture in advance of the surgery and then also in her recovery. And she has been, you know, dabbled in acupuncture, you know, over the arc of, you know, much of her adult life, but she really thought that that was a major component and it was, uh, you know, certainly not on the, the Western plan and it was something she did out of pocket and perhaps depending on where your worldview is a little strange or a little woo woo, but, um, she thought that that really had an impact. And, um, you know, again, like the, you know, the, the doctors and the PTs, they would just say, I don't know if that is or not, but that it probably was. I can't really say for sure. But really when she, uh, 
she would share these to people who asked her what the secret was. If, if, if losing weight wasn't the first one or being at a lean weight for your, uh, for your surgery, then acupuncture, she's like, I lost all of them. And, um, <laughs> it's seriously like, she's like, no one, n- none of them did it really. Yeah. And this isn't, you know, there's kind of a high frequency of a, a knee replacement among her peers. And she's like, no one did it. And they, they would have, you know, rougher recoveries. And, um, it seems like in her in in her telling of the story, what they wanted was a pill, or they wanted something that was more immediate or more of a trick, as opposed to um, potentially a woo woo type practice, and then a sort of a longer term, you know, body composition uh, goal. Mm-hmm. And uh, kind of a f- funny funny side note to this is that uh, um, my dad had a uh, knee replacement after her and i was talking with him and uh he he probably falls under the you know he i mean he's an open-minded guy but he's not as into the woo-woo stuff maybe if we want to call acupuncture that Mm -hmm. and he's like uh i'm like are you doing it and he's like oh yeah yeah i don't know if i believe it but i'm doing it because uh this is almost a direct quote because if i don't and my recovery isn't as good i'll never hear the end of it and he had he had good recoveries as well so i just think that uh I don't know this um it, it's just a one of one you know we say that an n of one experience but i think it's pretty interesting that people could be curious enough to ask because they see the results and then uh, sort of be reluctant and 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 close-minded to the the idea of the answer and uh even when it's been successful so anyway that's kind of a like a pre and post surgery story but in the realm of surgery i just thought it was pretty interesting well it's a great lesson and n equals one always is valuable you know i I think i've seen n equals several thousand that also would would support uh, exactly what you said uh Mm -hmm. in that well anything that's meaningful or worthwhile usually takes hard work. And so she accepted that, took it seriously, uh, did the, you know, kind of quote unquote prehab and also, you know, mm. got the body composition uh, in a, a good state, health status, good. I'm going to talk about those in a moment. But um, oh, yeah. uh, but also like with the acupuncture, you know, you look at any number of modalities or therapies or adjunctive procedures and and they all have value and they all have merit. I think that's that's the first thing to say. And sometimes we're we're challenged scientifically to chase exactly what's happening. Like mm. you might say, well, we know that we're going to temporarily alter sensation and circulation with acupuncture and, and certainly with some other things. But also, um, you know, acupuncture has a really strong effect on the central nervous system, particularly the autonomic mm-hmm. nervous system. So we're actually get toning down that fight or flight sympathetic drive and we're uh, increasing the the vagal tone and the parasympathetic rest and digest and heal and recover side of things and so yeah um that uh, totally uh, uh uh substantiated so um that's uh th- there's some good messages there and I'm I'm glad she had a great outcome as did your dad um and then, like, I won't, uh, I won't beat this point down too much, but I had an interesting injury. You know, it's funny, I was talking about Galen Rupp earlier because um, <laughs> I had a, it's, I can laugh, and it's kind of funny, I had a traumatic injury from running. <laughs> and uh, uh, this, gosh, this was... Why uh, is that funny, oh, John? Man, I don't know, I think it was like 12 years ago. But okay. it, uh, uh, I was running, and it was like this time of year. And at, at, at the time, I was doing a little more uh, running than I'm doing right now, although I can still run some. Um, I've had I've had a couple of different knee injuries, had two knee surgeries, but uh, the the one that this one is all about is uh, uh, I I was training for uh, training for track and it was early in the year, so we had a, like a spring snow and I uh, I had been running a, a workout at the track and where I lived at the time was only gosh about uh, two miles away and so I was jogging home and mm-hmm. also at that time um, our community uh, hadn't. Uh, uh, you know, experience the building growth that it has now. And so there was actually uh, several large, uh, like farm fields, you know, vacant fields uh, mm-hmm. between uh, where I was at the track and then getting back to my neighborhood. So sorry for the long winded story. <laughs> well, um, it's that fresh snow, you know, and uh, I'm just jogging across the field. I'm taking a shortcut because I am inherently lazy, you know, so that we need to always you know, accept that about me. <laughs> it's like, I can get home you know, without doing as much work. <laughs> but uh, 
but I'd already done my work there. So that's fair. Sure. Yeah, so, you're after uh, a run. So I think we, yeah. you maybe maybe get a pass on that one. But uh, uh, my on on one of the uh, you know 179 or 646 strides across this field. I don't know how many it was. Uh, my left foot went down through the snow, but it it kept going <laughs> because there was this uh, large rodent hole. Um, oh which, no! Yeah, it was like it was about 18 inches deep. Oh. Uh, but it was, you know, covered by the fresh snow. And so I just managed to find oh, it in the middle of this field. And so, so uh, you know, suddenly, you know, when you're, when you're so surprised, your foot's going down and then it goes like 18 inches lower. And then, you know, you, I hit with a thud and, and slammed down and I felt a pretty strong snap in my knee. Mm. And I, I laid there for a second, you know, and it, you know, not every knee injury is that painful compared to some parts of the body. But I was like, oh, yeah, I think I, I think I injured myself pretty well. Uh, so I was like, oh, you know. Uh, like a thoroughbred. Uh, this is what we worry about. <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't straighten, can't bend. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be fairly crooked, but I'm going to have to limp home. And so ultimately I had had what's known as a posterior lateral corner injury to my knee. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, you end up uh, – uh, tearing some things, you know, a ligament, meniscus, joint capsule, muscle, you know, pretty good number. Um, and I had to have uh, a, a, a surgical experience with that. And uh, that was done extremely well. And, uh, you know, it looked like my outcome was going to be pretty good. And so, uh, again, people that I interacted with, I was involved with, wonderful job. Uh, where things went wrong, here's the lesson, is... Mm me um i was i was too motivated and, and so this is an interesting thing we see this a lot you know people have goals you know and they you know they're motivated they're, they they want to do the work or they want to get back to something and so i was feeling pretty good to be honest with you uh first week after surgery so i thought you know okay i sort of know what i'm doing here which is dangerous sometimes uh i'm just gonna i'm just gonna push it a little bit you know not too much just push it a little bit in terms of what i'm doing uh rehabilitative fashion and you know my knee blew up it swelled up uh it kind of locked up and i couldn't bend or straighten it uh, uh for like a month you know for the most part yeah. and so so i you know i that's humbling you know i learned my lesson and then you know prog uh, progressed uh uh accordingly and have had a very good outcome with that but but i think the message there anyone who's having a surgery you know not only in like your mom's case of doing all that stuff on the front end um and it does make your outcome better but also uh embracing the process on the back end and uh working through the steps or the phases and not pushing too hard in fact i tell all my clients is you know one of my things uh, we want to be conservative early and aggressive late and that's how you yeah. want to approach your rehab john i think that i'm so glad you shared that story because and it contradicts the idea that you see yourself as lazy at every turn but uh it, it i think that is a thing that we we have talked about at length here where you got to rest hard and in particular in recovery um being motivated and wanting to feeling kind of good and wanting to push it a little bit is detrimental. I mean, you know, just that one session sounds like it sort of uh, set you back several weeks just because of uh, your body wasn't ready for it. So I think that that's a, that's a wonderful message and super applicable. And I think it's something that, you know, particular driven athletes can identify with where that could be a difficult part. You're, you're going to want to go too hard too soon, potentially be on the lookout for that. Yeah, it gets back to that instinctive wisdom principle that we sometimes use here. And I, I certainly have more of it now than I did then. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, that's really the key is that, you know, we really have to listen to that body. And the mind is so powerful, it can push and override, but then the body will remind us if we did it inappropriately. So yeah, uh, good, good lessons all. And then what I have uh, put together for our audience is just some basic tips for anyone who's um, undergoing and recovering from surgery that sort of pull out the nuggets we got from those stories. John, I am ready for the nugs. Let's okay. hear them. So um, shout out to uh, your mom and for, for her being so awesome. <laughs> and if your surgery is elective or it's non-emergent, so you have some time to pre sure. prepare for it, get into the best health status you can and the best body weight. And the, the health status makes your, uh, you know, tolerance, uh, uh, and recovery from the surgical uh, process better, and also 
the the more ideal your body weight is suddenly now when you're incapacitated it's so much easier to move around yeah and this is something that i i you know we hear about in terms of professional athletes where especially if they have an injury or a minor surgery their back and their recovery times almost seem superhuman but i think one of the reasons is that they go in at optimal health and really at great body comps in a lot of times and so um, I think that it's, uh, it, it absolutely is um, an important thing. And then also, I don't know, John, this, I'm, I'm curious, like, how, how many folks do this? Do you see this? It seems like it's maybe perhaps not done enough for these non-elective or non-emergent or elective surgeries. I think it's population specific mm, okay. or, or population dependent. In other words, if we have, uh, you know, a very health oriented, active, athletic uh, population like your mom is in, your mom and your dad and you, sure. um, yeah, it's almost like it's Captain Obvious. It's the no brainer. Yeah, I'm going to, this is what I need to do. I'm going to do it. There's not that much questioning. But when you start to look at statistics of um, unhealthy America and, you know, you, you can start naming all the different you know, obesity, diabetes, uh, there's social cultural issues, economic issues, all things to be uh, looked at with concern. Um, yeah, I mean, we just see people just not doing it and not getting good outcomes because of that. Mm, okay. What else do we have? Well, I would say this, when, when you're looking at a joint, like say a shoulder or knee or any other joint you want to name, try to get that joint, if it's possible, as free of inflammation and swelling as you can before you go into the procedure it you know that makes the procedure work better um you know you come out of it faster and also you know inflammation and swelling is really what promotes scar tissue so if we want more scarring and or let's say it this way if we want less scarring and stiffness uh, go in with uh, less of that and you'll come out with it as well i'm a huge advocate for addressing the inflammation so that absolutely makes sense um what else are we thinking about well i say likewise get as mobile in terms of range of motion flexibility mobility whichever words you like and strong as the circumstances allow and everything will be easier again that that helps the direct injured area but if the body is just ready to do things you know in, you can have you can have a wrist injury and ironically suddenly now it's hard to get in and out of bed because of how we use our bodies and so you you can only imagine if a person has a like say any type of major procedure you know at a like a hip knee shoulder back or maybe and I don't usually recommend this several at the same time if it's not an emergency yeah. I like to push them out because if you take out most or not most but if you just take out some of the major functional areas of the body you know you can't do anything you know you can't really you know go to the, use your restroom, you know, bathe yourself, you know, dress, it, all those things become exponentially difficult. And so, I mean, that's where we want the occupational therapists on our team because they're so good at helping us to adapt and modify and succeed in that. But also if you can, if you can do less of that on the front end, uh, or, or, well, I, I, let me say that better. Uh, you know, we, if we have a chance to pick only one surgery at a time, yeah, let's do that. But then the other thing I meant at the beginning was if you're just a, a more agile mobile beast, uh, you're going to be able to move around and get around so much uh, easier. No question. And I think I, all three of those points kind of work together about if you can prepare in advance, really anything that you can do to get ready um, with your body is going to help with the outcome. Um, what else are we thinking about here? What are your tips or nugs? Yeah, just real quick, I would say prepare ahead of time, you know, with, with food, make some food and, you know, stock your fridge if you can and have some meals frozen and make arrangements for help or whatever you need. Look at any safety issues you have in your home, like tripping hazards or whatever. If you're not going to be able to sleep in the bed, set up something you know, ahead of time so that everything's ready and you you really, you, you won't... Uh, uh, you won't regret that at all. You'll really appreciate it. So that'd be one thing. Uh, another would be on this whole pain thing, you know, everyone's pain experience is different and, and we never want to judge someone else's pain experience, but um, it's, it's important to stay ahead of the pain, the post-operative pain. 
So there's not much to gain by just being a hero and being macho, toughening out those first few days. We're really trying to knock down pain, knock down inflammation. And, you know, you just, uh, you know, you, you gain really nothing and add misery that is unnecessary. Yeah, John, I think that that is a huge component. Personally, I've experienced it, but also just witnessing that uh, it's seen, you know, like the maybe it'll happen in the first handful of days. So I'm feeling pretty good. Maybe it's an ankle. Maybe, let's say it's an ankle surgery at this point and it's feeling pretty good. And I'm like, I want to get up and move around. I have it. And then it's like, well, I was, I really pushed it to not pushed in terms of training, but just that, that wasn't staying ahead of the pain. I think that's a huge component, um, especially early days. Yeah. And with pain also, I mentioned, you know, it's a personal experience, of course, but sure. I, I try, you know, you have to be, I think you have to be delicate depending upon the person you're speaking to, but I try to say, let's try to take emotion out of pain because if you inject emotion into your pain experience, yeah. it magnifies it. And so it's like, okay, you know, let's, to the extent that you can be a firewalker, uh, let's do that. And, and it really helps because again, if we start to get emotional, we start to alter mm. how the, the central nervous system is behaving and we can actually make ourselves worse. Mm. Okay. That's great. That's, that's really helpful. hard to do perhaps, but that's, that's good stuff. Yeah. And as I mentioned before, um, uh, hard things take work, but they mean something. So uh, get realistic about the healing, rehabilitation, training and competing or return to life activity timeline. So that one, that's, uh, that's actually going to be in my, it's a part of, it's part of my new book, uh, you know, in the injury section um, about, uh, you know, training through the lifespan uh, as a lifetime athlete, but we've talked about it on the show before as well, uh, using those different mechanisms about, you know, when injuries happen, you have kind of a, you know, different phases or stages of injury, but then you also have these steps that you take to let the body heal and then get into rehab and basic function and then training and rebuilding. And then ultimately, you know, whatever it is that you wanted to get back to those things overlap a little bit, but they actually are fairly distinct blocks. I think getting really, again, these are some of it's common sense, but it really is putting the whole package together. All right. So we kind of covered the surgical experience and nuggets. What about rehab? What about the rehabilitation process? Yeah. I, I'd echo it again. I mentioned it before, but you know, get the idea of being conservative early, be a little gentle, work with the body. Don't push too hard and then be aggressive late. That's when you want to pour some sweat and get after it, you know, once it's safe to do so. And so again, a, a conservative early, aggressive late, great philosophy for most things. Uh -huh. um, you know, hire a good physical therapist uh, or another rehab professional. Although I'd say, you know, obviously the, this really, you know, recovering from orthopedic surgery really is one of the 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 realms or wheelhouses for the PT. Um, get them to help you with that process. And then what, as just as you mentioned with the physicians, use him or her as indicated. So, uh, you know, but what I mean by that is, you know, uh, how many visits you go, how often the things that you do, you know, obviously you got, there's, it's a, it's a personal personality and, and uh, professional selection issue. You got to find the person that's going to offer what you need and then also you jive with how they do that um somebody who tells uh, uh, a, a lot of bad jokes and quotes austin powers movies and is always singing rock and roll poorly like me you know not everybody likes that so I, that's okay don't work with me work with somebody else <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you don't like that then you're probably not listening to this show for yeah well <laughs> uh, you know you okay. made me think of something like way back uh, earlier you were talking about working with uh your physicians like, doctor, doctor, give me the news. I got a bad case of loving you. And that was uh, Robert Palmer, you know, uh, for also from Simply Irresistible. <laughs> I don't know why it came into my mind. Uh, okay. No, I mean, John, uh, because it, you can't, can't help yourself. You're a prodigy. I mean, you're, uh, you're a savant. <laughs> well, there's something there. Uh, okay, so be patient and expect a few ups and downs. You know, we were talking at the Hard to Kill workshop the other day that, you know, the human experience is nonlinear, you know, and so you're going to have data points where, you know, uh, it's not a 45 degree slope uh, from, uh, you know, surgery to recovery and outcome. Uh, when you look at it closely from day to day, sure, if you back up enough and we draw a line of best fit on the data points, yeah, okay, but uh, not to believe, uh, belabor that point. Um, understand uh, the basics of progression. And so this is where, you know, your, you know, 
your coach or your therapist can help you really we we in most cases it'll vary based on procedure and area of the body but we want to achieve some amount of passive motion uh and progress to active motion so passive is just you know somebody else is moving your limb or something is uh and then active you're recruiting your muscles to move that limb through space depends on what position we put you in relative to gravity we want to work on mobility as overall mobility uh, uh you know probably get more of that before we, we worry too much about strength, but we want to work in those capacities, mobility to strength. We'll work in partial to full range of motion from slow to fast speeds, from simple to complex movement patterns. And then, you know, from assisted ultimately to independent management or training. And that's a good, you know, just hodgepodge of things that we try to do in say like rehab, we do in strength and conditioning, physical prep, you know, you take a person through. So uh, I'm feeling like I should explain that a little bit. Well, I'll have a person who comes in if they're if it's day one post-operative, and who knows, maybe we're gonna, uh, you know, change their dressings, and there's not, we're gonna give them a lot of education, perhaps, but they might be in a very um, quiet room with, you know, safeties observed, and we might do just a few simple things and. And establish them. So this is like what you do for your home exercises, and there's only three of them. And here's some pictures. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. You know, and then we keep progressing and progressing and progressing until just before their quote unquote discharge, so they don't need us anymore. Now I'm bringing them into a busy gym environment. Music is blasting. It's chaotic. There's stuff going on everywhere, and I'm challenging them to move through high speed with good execution, good force, good range of motion. Um, you know, uh, and, and basically ingrain or execute their motor pattern on autopilot so that they're not, you know, blown away. And if they can do that, then, you know, there's not much in life that, you know, you can't be sure, uh, ensured that that function is going to be, you know, it's going to be there. John, I'm so glad you described that. That is, re it's really tangible and uh, it makes a hell of a lot of sense. Oh yeah. And it's just so much, so much damn fun <laughs> too. And, uh, and I think, you know, again, I think most, most practitioners do a good job of it. Um, so we always, you know, uh, encourage uh, those progressions to happen. Uh, real quick at the end here, expect most of your rehabilitation stays for most orthopedic surgeries to be about one to four months. Uh, again, there's going to be exceptions, but that's a good time. Sure. Benchmark. Uh, visits, you know, uh, frequency. Uh, I've got stories about this. You know, they, they might be two to three times per week initially. Again, this is post-surgical model. Um, and then we could cut down to even one or two times per month at the end. You never go more than you need to go. And I think that's the ethical clinician uh, model, of course. And it's amazing, uh, you know, how much can get done in that time. And so I, I always encourage my, my colleagues, my peers, I get to do a little collegial consulting is you never want to babysit people while they recover spontaneously. That's not additive. You know, we've got to make a difference and make every appointment count mm -hmm. and don't do another until it's time to do so. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, there's an impetus or onus on us to do that. And then lastly, this is for everyone, what you do at home, you know, so that's, that is the home exercise program, but it's also all those other things you do to support healing. Um, is most important. If you have two hours at the clinic, you've got 166 of your own that make the difference. So make the win. Mm, John, that seems to be now. This is this is my question. Can you tell as a PT if someone is, or I should say, I'm sure you can't tell, but how how like uh, how big of a difference can you see in someone who's recovering? And who's doing the stuff at home, the holistic program, in addition to the exercises, but the sleep and the recovery versus someone who is, you know, maybe just doing the, the, uh, doing the stuff when they come to rehab. Is it, is it pretty, uh, pretty noticeable? Oh, absolutely. Totally. hundred percent instantaneous. And, mm -hmm. and so, but here's the, there's two things that have to happen with that. You know, first of all, we, we have to give them the right things to do, you know, so it's got to be, mm -hmm. these are the things that are going to work for you. Um, I understand, you know, what your constraints are in terms of, you know, time and equipment and access. Mm -hmm. And so we, we want to make it fit. I also am a big fan of single digit exercise programs. You know, mm -hmm. the minute you give a person, even when they demand a 27 item list, results go down. And so, you know, let's keep it, yeah. you know, let's, you know, half dozen or so things uh, clear. 
Okay, so we give them the right things to do and, the, and the, you know, the constraints or the parameters of how it should be done. Yeah, and then if they do it, whoa, I mean, the amazing, the progress just, it, it really starts to get as close to linear as a human can do. Mm-hmm. Whereas the person who, you know, comes in the clinic, you know, they're a little rusty, they make a tiny bit of advancement forward. And then they, you know, that recedes that when they go, that's just a, it's a waste of everybody's time and, and somebody's money, you know? And so I'm, I'm always mm. uh, a taskmaster on that stuff, you know, sure. uh, whether it's when I used to work with a lot of students on that or, or even just, you know, working with a, a person say, Hey, look, you know, um, uh, or talking to insurance companies, which sometimes that would be a, a kind of a rage fest for me. But, um, you know, I, I think we don't really need much in the way of quote unquote managed care if we're, if we're doing, and this is what I would get into a lot with uh, to, uh, some of these, these, uh, you know, case review people. And I would say, well, this is going really well. Um, you know, I need you to offer, I authorize three more visits. And I'd say, uh, well, we, we don't do that. We, we do that in, vi- in blocks of six. I said, I don't need six visits. I don't want six visits. I don't want monies to be paid. We only need the three. Well, you know, you can't. And I'm like, you know, it's like we have problems when when these things exist. (laughs) We do have problems when these things exist. Uh, I love that. John, that was absolutely useful information. I appreciate it. Pow, bam. And so, hey, listen, if you guys want to get into this metabolic flexibility thing, uh, by all means, email me, reach out to me directly. That's how I'm setting this one up. So it's john at the lifetimeathlete.com. And I will put you on the list, VIP list. I don't care if I get three people or 300. I have the capacity to to work with all of you. And we're going to do a Zoom meeting on Friday at 7 a.m. If you are... uh, not crazy about the morning. Well, maybe there'll be something else down the road for you, but that's what that's all about. So please feel free to do that. Uh, as always, I try to ask, you know, if we could get a rating and review, love a five star if you feel that we're worth it. Um, and, a, and, a, and a sentence or two that says how, uh, you know, this uh, podcast and mission impacts you. If you have any questions or comments, fire them out through any of the media platforms or to me directly. And Maybe last but not least, if you would like to uh, get some more resources, uh, the lifetimeathlete.com uh, continues to grow with, uh, with things for uh, clients that are supportive and free. And also, if you want to work with me in a coaching capacity, you can find out how to do it there. Get at Jay-Z. Do it. <laughs> awesome. So thanks, PK. Thanks, audience. And you guys just keep uh, being awesome. And we'll catch you next time. Adios, everyone.